What's up, world? Back again. This is episode two of Academics in Cars. I'm Dr. Jared Ball. And catching up with this brother for one or two for a long time, my colleague here at Morgan State University, rocking the hat, uh, Dr. Lawrence Brown. Um, so as we get started, if you would just just outline for us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what your role maybe here at Morgan State is. Uh, as, as, as we move, you know, we'll be moving around Baltimore a little bit. This is obviously where we work. Right. And where you do a lot of work. Right. So, yeah, anyway, welcome, man. Appreciate you taking the time. And, and yes, yeah, so let's start with that. Who, who is, who, who are you and what is it that you, you do? Well, I mean, I guess you could say, I mean, I'm the grandson of sharecroppers uh, mm. from the Mississippi Delta. Mm. And, uh, you know, they, my grandparents, all four were from Mississippi. Okay. And so my hometown is West Memphis, Arkansas. Okay. Uh, which, you know, is a small town, maybe thirty thousand people. Um, my mom and dad uh, really grew grew up uh, in their early years as children. They were still picking cotton down in uh, in soybeans. Oh wow! <laughs> down in those fields. So so they predated the soy craze that's going on now. <laughs> yeah. I hope they cashed in a little bit. Uh, well, I mean, on the they were ride. you know they weren't quite sharecroppers <laughs> of my parents, but you know they were you know. I'm sure making somebody else profit from picking those right, uh, right. cash crops. And so, uh, but at the same time, they were, you know, my grandfather was a Baptist minister. My uh, mother uh, became a minister. You know, they always valued education and uh, basically became, uh, it's interesting, I, I sort of think, you know, I kind of went from, our family's gone from like sharecroppers to professors like in two generations. And, wow, uh, wow. You know, but like I say, they were geniuses as well. It just wasn't expressed in its academic form or format. But at any rate, fast forward, I basically came to Baltimore in 2010, September, under the guise of a fellowship, postdoctoral fellowship, after I finished my doctoral degree at uh, the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. Um, and that was after wrapping up my bachelor's at Morehouse in, in 01 and then uh, getting a master's degree at the University of Houston and, uh, and what is, in 04. So what is your, your doctorate in? And then tell us a little bit about your specialty real quick because right. I know that, I mean, that'll lead us right into what what we want to be talking a little bit about today. Yeah, it was like uh, my doctoral degree, the program was called Health Outcomes and Policy Research. And my dissertation was really looking at how neighborhoods, uh, culture, and history impact health outcomes and produce health disparities. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of the discussion in like health research is like, you know, why you have like black people living shorter lifespans, having a greater burden of disease, um, and living a lower quality of life in terms of these conditions, asthma, heart disease, cancer, HIV that afflict uh, black people disproportionately, and so just I really real quick how how if you could j just quickly summarize a lot of work and research, right? Because this actually I would relate directly to something I know we're going to end up talking about. How bad is it, so to speak? I mean, these disparities you're talking about, right? I mean, and, and maybe is it, and then it is in particular here in Baltimore. What, right? What are we looking at? Yeah, I mean. You know, almost universally, uh, the story is not good. The disparities are broad and they're enduring. You know, disparities that existed 50 years ago still exist. In other words, we haven't made much, if any, progress in terms of reducing these disparities. Mm. But at the same time, you know, a lot of the the way we frame health disparities is sort of like comparing black people to white people, which in it of itself can sometimes be problematic uh, in the sense that whites are sort of viewed as the reference group uh, by which black people need to compare themselves. Now, to the degree there's a power dynamic that needs to be explored mm -hmm. that makes sense. I mean, but wouldn't that be the standard here in this country? For right, instance? and so given the historical right, okay. context, right, 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 we can say that, that there, the comparison uh, should be made. But at the same time, what if black people's health could be better? <laughs> you know, oh, right, right. what if white people's health <laughs> right, is not right, what is? Right, 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 right. I got you, I got you. Right, right, of course. Uh, of course. Because when you look internationally, 
Uh, and sometimes, especially when immigrants come to America, sometimes there's a paradox that you call the immigrant paradox, where initially when they arrive, they may have better health outcomes That's than right. white people do. That's right. And so, right. you know, it's like, well, you know, should they always be the people that we compare ourselves to? And, I think and there have been arguments. I remember years ago, I read something called, I think they called the Paleolithic Prescription. Right. That argued that once upon a time, humanity just in general actually lived longer and healthier lives than in the modern industrial mm. era, uh, largely because of just the argument. Well, I'm not an expert, just right. the argument in right. this particular book had to do with uh, amounts of work and time that we now put in to sustaining our lives mm -hmm. that we did not have to previously do in mm. earlier versions of humanity. Right, right. So anyway, but yeah, I mean, anyway, but I got you. Yeah, I think, you know, the... You know, we are living in a society that's highly advanced in terms of technology mm. and medicine. You know, America is a leading country in, in that sense. But it, when you compare our outcomes to other developed countries, they actually rank, we actually rank very poorly in terms of, you know, infant mortality, mm. in terms of like longevity in life. You know, we're, we're like at the bottom of developed countries. So it goes to show that you know, even though we have all this technology, there's not a lot of equity. There's not a lot of democracy in the way that these technologies and access to resources are deployed. And that's really a function of, you know, like I was looking at in my dissertation, the neighborhoods in which we live, which were structured by a particular uh, sort of white supremacist ideology in terms of racial segregation. And like this road that we're on right now, uh, yeah, this is, York Road. Right, this York is a Road, real right? dividing line, like in the city. You know, when I when I look at this on a map, you know, to the west we have, you know, pretty much the white L, and to the right we have the black butterfly. So, like this community to the right over here. Look, look I, this is crazy. Yeah. I was just in a meeting with, and this is actually related to what I wanted to talk to you about today, with one of my new colleagues in the Institute for Urban Research. Right, right. Glenn Robinson, I think is his. Mm. Do you know him? I don't. But anyway, he. this is the first, he, yesterday, I have been, I mean, I'm, I'm from D.C., grew up in Howard County, ah. did spend a little bit of time educationally in a Quaker private school in Charles Street in right. the ninth grade. Right. But that's my experience with Baltimore. Right. Other than the 10 years, 11 years I've been working at Morgan. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, this was yesterday was the first time I heard the white L, black butterfly description. Right. So for all of the late passes like me <laughs> and those who might not understand Baltimore. Right. Break that down as we drive north on York Road. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 what you were just talking about, this, this, the white L and the black butterfly. Well, you know, I think when I came here in 2010, people were already, I, I thought I heard this term white L, like basically in the center of the city. Right. You run down and we're actually approaching um, Roland Park, uh, Guilford, Homeland, like all of this is in the northern part of the city. Mm -hmm. And you just run down the middle of the city uh, where you go down and you end up uh, Remington, Charles Village, uh, downtown, Midtown, Belvedere, uh, and you run south along Charles Street in St. Paul, right. and you get to and you get to downtown in the Inner Harbor, and then you bank east lo along Alice Anna, and you're hitting like Federal Hill, right. Canton. You're hitting, uh, you know, those neighborhoods that are going along the waterfront, and that's sort of the white L, like in the center of the city, and then along the waterfront going east on Alice Anna. That's where the large majority of our white population is concentrated. Um, and the sort of easternmost boundary of the White L is the road that we're on right now, York Road. So, so, so just that real was quick. the White L. Wow. Okay. So just real quick, we're going to come back to this. This is what I was talking about, my colleagues at the Institute for Urban Research and Glenn Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, 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 one of the senior faculty members in that, that institute, uh, who's done a lot of work on transportation, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, very interesting work that I'm, I'm just now catching up to, unfortunately, late again to. Right. Um, we're heading to the county now. Okay, so we're about to we're about to loop back in because I want to I want to stay in the city for this, but but uh, maybe you can talk quickly about this county division. But mm -hmm. I just want to point out that Glenn Robinson does a lot of this work, and we have already talked about we're going to be doing 
an, an episode of Academics in Cars with him uh, specifically at some point to get like a full detailed tour of not only the city, but as, uh, per his research, exactly how and why the transportation system and, yeah. and, and, and roads and streets are set up and how they're changing and how right. they, of course, end up uh, unfortunately negatively impacting the poorer and blacker elements of the city. So right. uh, there's a lot of politics. to, And what I was asking was why I want to know the politics behind why I'm stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be perfect to be in traffic right, right, with him right, talking right, about right, this. Right. So anyway, <laughs> so as we, we hit, you're saying we're hitting the end here of uh, uh, the north end of uh, the white L. Yeah, and you know, Baltimore really is a hyper-segregated city, category five. Uh, when you look at the research of Douglas Massey out of the uh, uh, Princeton University, um, you know, he talks about, he's talked about for a long time, him and his colleague Nancy Denton wrote the book American Apartheid. Right. And really sort of described, you know, the way in which, uh, you know, several cities in America remain hyper-segregated. So what does um, category five mean exactly? It's the absolute worst. It's like a hurricane. And so... Oh, man. <laughs> when you're talking about category five... I just uh, did a category five U-turn. <laughs> <laughs> Very definitely, I might add. Right, okay. You know, real smooth <laughs> U-turn right there. <laughs> but yeah, category five is, I mean, basically they had, there's five different categories. Low, uh, moderate, high hyper-segregation category four and hyper-segregation category five. And Baltimore is in the category five, which is the most hyper-segregated a city can get in terms of uh, the indices that they use. And so, and that makes sense because where we are right now, where we're driving, you know, is is a part of that story about how Baltimore became such a hyper-segregated city. Baltimore invented racial zoning in 1910. Um, and basically pioneered another uh, construct called racially restrictive covenants right in this area that we're driving in, North Baltimore, these communities uh, that were developed by the Roland Park Company. Mm. The Roland Park Company developed Baltimore neighborhoods that are like uh, Roland Park, Guilford, Homeland, and later Northwood, which is near our campus, uh, the original Northwood. Uh, right, and right. so they had a competitor named Forest Park and so company. The Forest Park Company, and that's in West Baltimore, they developed like Forest Park, Ashburton. And so these type of communities, they utilize and deployed racially restricted covenants, which are deeds, the home covenant, the deed for your home, basically saying, hey, welcome to your home. So glad for you to live in the community. You can't do this, you can't do that. Shrubs gotta be cut, yard needs right. to be mowed. And by the way, when you sell the home, you cannot sell to Negroes. And so it restricted where black people can live. And Baltimore pioneered both of those are this area, which actually was a part of the county at the time, was later annexed by the city a hundred years ago in the spring of 1918. So Baltimore is like created and helped facilitate the erection of American apartheid. Wow. And so that's what we have here. Category five, hyper segregated city. And it plays out in so many different ways, like the white L and the black butterfly where you have you know, east of York Road, west of 83, where the majority of people of African descent live in this city. Um, and this is just, and th those are meant as descriptions. So if you're looking down at a map of the city, right, and you, you'll see what will end up looking like a white L and a black butterfly exactly. of of segregation. Right. And I coined the term black butterfly oh, back really? in 2015. Yeah. That's you. That was me. That's you. <laughs> that's me. So as my colleague Dr. Heaton I was saying the rate, that's you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Because literally, I'm look, I, if you look at... I didn't even know that. We were just getting together to have a meeting today. Right. Jumped in the car for this episode and here I find out <laughs> that I'm meeting with the man that started what I just learned about it. So I'm glad it, at least on some level that you just coined it not that long ago. I don't feel that bad. Right, but I right. am definitely late, and and uh, that's no. It's a beautiful thing. It's that's a beautiful <laughs> thing to find out that people that the term got like deployed and utilized. Like, well, I can. I, I just left a meeting with again one of the leading scholars on the issue of Baltimore race mm -hmm. transportation, and it was brought up there. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, it's that's, been picked up in the city, like planning circles and people who look at 
uh, the way that this city operates. In the, I know in the planning department specifically, you know, they, they've they told me, and I've seen maps where they actually created, like they put a butterfly on it in one of these wow. uh, sort of seminars they were holding or workshops. So I was like, you know, right. it's actually, and, and, but the greater thing is that it's used on the streets too. Like I've seen people that not in academic circles, not in government circles, you know, students, young people, grade school, like they're using it. And so that's really gratifying to me. Uh, and I mean, of course, it's an oversimplification. There's right, nuance right, right. there. Uh, and then we have other communities. I mean, you know, the Asian community is clustered um, very tightly on this street that we're about to turn on, Charles Street, because they're very much... Uh, many of them are students, so they're very close to Johns Hopkins, right. which is right down the center of the city, Homewood campus. And so you go down further south, uh, they sort of are clustered along the Saint Ch- or the Charles St. Paul corridor uh, in the White L, which I think is very fascinating because I think that sort of is a, a reflection of the model minority myth. The Asian community is able exactly to cluster right. Right. very closely with the white community in ways that, you know, black folks have not been able to And live. in a different context. You're talking about in yes. a more affluent part of the city right. as as students at one of the more prestigious universities right. in the in the country, if Absolutely. not beyond that. Right. Uh, so the interaction and then never mind the history that 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 predates all of that being very exactly. different. Exactly. Um, uh, so in our Latino community, I yeah, want to say no, briefly, yeah, yeah, yeah. is clustered around uh, Patterson Park in southeast right. Baltimore. Uh, so uh, what I like to say is that there's the white L, black butterfly, Asian archipelago, archipelago, <laughs> archipelago, archipelago. <laughs> archipelago. Thank you. Yeah, the Asian archipelago and the Latino lagoon. Wow. Uh, well, I should say it again. So what I like to say is that there's the white L, black butterfly, Asian archipelago, and the Latina lagoon. Archipelago. Archipelago and the Latina lagoon. So okay. I think like that's the uh, fascinating way, like when you look at Dustin Cable's racial dot map mm. out of the University of Virginia, like these patterns become really apparent. And so... You know, it all plays out like in very fascinating ways. But black people are 63 percent of the population in this city. Yeah, I was just going to ask. So, so real quick, give us the, if you can, the the, the population, the demographics. So, yeah. how big is the city in total population? Right. And then you said it's 63 percent black, and then we'll right. Go from so there. we're yeah. talking about we were at 620 thousand. Mm-hmm. We experienced a decline. We're probably around 615, 615 thousand now, um, and basically the. The demographic split of that is the city is 63% black, about 29% white, uh, maybe four or five percent Asian, and nine, eight or nine percent Hispanic or Latino. I just need to say this is the first time we're driving by Baltimore Friends School. This is literally the first time I've driven by here since I left in ninth grade. Wow. And I've been working in the city for 11 years and somewhat hanging out around, but. So to certain, and, and to a certain, to somewhat exaggerate or to uh, uh, elaborate on your point, mm-hmm. I'm never over here. Not that I, I don't live in the city, but mm-hmm. I don't. I just am never over here, mm-hmm. and have never been over here since leaving in ninth grade. So that's right. 1980. I don't know five. Right. Um, uh, uh, and and it's just fascinating that if you. Also, while I was a student here, mm-hmm. I didn't experience any other part of the city. Right, right. So you could live here, you could you could work here, you can go to school here, and and the the the, the category five segregation mm-hmm. uh, can can uh, that's actually kind of interesting. We just don't anyway. But go ahead, yeah. So yeah. so uh, I'm sorry, six hundred fifteen thousand strong right. population. Right. Sixty three percent black. Right. And then how are the other groups divided up? About twenty nine percent white. Eight or nine percent Latino, uh, and then about four or five percent Asian, and of course Latino is not a race. Yeah. Uh, so those numbers don't add up to one hundred percent. That's why. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of blur, and yeah, there's a lot of. We yeah, do have some right. Afro Latino people. That's right. Here, so that's right. Along with uh, more uh, European. Right. As well. Right. Um, and then where does do you do you off the top of your head have have that racial divide? I mean, the wealth divide or the or the income divide? Uh, like we were looking at that. Right. <laughs> Here's the pie chart of the population: sixty-three uh-huh. percent black. But right. uh, something tells me the wealth and the income is not sixty-three 
33% black. Well, I don't know that sort of uh, like the income breakdown, mm -hmm. except, you know, maybe only about 10% of black families earn like over $100,000. Okay. Uh, and that's families, not individuals. Right, households. Right, that's right. Families. Because I do know nationally, it's mm -hmm. only like five percent of the pop of individuals make over a hundred thousand a year. Right, and that's all races. Right, so, so it's, it's it's not right. It's a little confused. People think this. <laughs> yeah, the distribution of, of wealth or income in Baltimore, I should say, is such that you know most of the black people in this city. Uh, are at the lower end, earning less than 50000 whereas mm -hmm. the white population income distribution is a bit more even. Maybe a third of whites earn over 100000 and it's they're so they're very more so top heavy, right? Whereas the black population skews bottom heavy in terms of income distribution. And I don't want to I don't want to put value on it, but I'll just recognize that this this part of the town looks different than, than <laughs> it's completely than different. We it's wild, man. This is <laughs> Not, I, this is very like, this is I was almost getting lost. Like, this, is, right? and, like this is crazy. You drive in the white L, and you like <laughs> this is Baltimore. Are we still in Baltimore? This is like this is crazy. oh my god. It's laid out like in an immaculate, like Harry Potter look. Right, it, it, that's, that's, <laughs> you know? a, it does look Harry Potterish. <laughs> yeah, you drive them in, you're like, oh my goodness. I, I need my wand and the cape. That's right. That's right. You know, Baltimore's around here somewhere. Yeah, that's right. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a couple of minutes. But you know, it's wild. They would do, there was like a. a, a, a it's interesting because I took this detour unintentionally. I had an, what I was initially going to do to sort of segue to the, what I wanted us to also talk about was I was going to make a U-turn on North Avenue and go back because right. in 2015 North Avenue took on a new. Oh, we're here to towards North Avenue. Okay, well, we're, okay, we're going this. Okay, mm -hmm. so we were on East of North Avenue. We're going to double back. Yeah, because that's Northern Parkway up there. So North Avenue what did is I actually say? further south. You said North Avenue or North Avenue. Okay, so, okay, right, so it's good that, okay, so this is all working out perfectly, because mm -hmm. I, I was, yeah, okay, that makes it, but I, but I wanted to see that, 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 well, just not that far in terms of, of geographic distance, Yeah. you know, uh, where I am more familiar, like with Washington, D.C., it's only a 10 square mile city, Right. but I, like every other city and every other place, it's, it's wildly different. Uh, just a few blocks even mm -hmm. and this is crazy these, yeah this is uh, this. <laughs> okay so so one this is sort of what so in 2015 North Avenue took right. on a new uh, national even international uh, relevance yep. and uh, North and Penn in particular taking on a whole so should I turn here then or just keep uh, going straight go straight <laughs> and um as the the what it describes as the post Freddie Gray funeral riots, mm -hmm. uprisings. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm even confused as to what I really think happened that day, mm -hmm. but but uh, um, brought new attention to to the city. Mm -hmm. And you can even see why mm -hmm. the, one of the first things white people would say, even in 2015, mm -hmm. is why are black people so upset? Because mm -hmm. if you live like this, right? Even if you don't are unconsciously aware that this is the result of other people having to live some way different. Mm -hmm. You could be confused into thinking, man, my life, like I'm living Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, it's, it's real. How can people be out in the streets angry, so angry? So I, now that's where you and I met mm -hmm. uh, initially, um, hmm. It's as far as I remember, mm -hmm. was was your involvement with covering the trial and the uprisings right, right, and right, right, right. commentary and critique and offering some context mm -hmm. and some of the analysis we've already heard in this discussion. One of the questions I wanted to ask you about is is specifically media coverage of that event. Right. Well, I think that's, you know, the naming of it was one of the first things that, you know, really uh, became apparent, you know, that the Baltimore Sun, uh, which which really in its origin is a white supremacist uh, propaganda organization or media outlet. And for those who don't know, the Baltimore Sun is the dominant mainstream newspaper or online press, whatever it is at this point. Right. Uh, yeah, in, in this city. Yes, yeah, the primary newspaper, and you know, just to rewind a bit, they, um, you know, promoted uh, this language during uh, the 19 teens and the 1920s of Negro invasion, 
there's a Negro invasion, and now, and they would oftentimes put the address oh, wow. of black people that moved into neighborhoods so as to help rally the the community to get them riled up so they could organize. Oh, I'm sure it was just to properly inform the audience <laughs> and to, be, nah, be, you get, to provide objective <laughs> journalism. Yeah, I'm working on a book now where I highlight this. I call it White Baltimore's War Against the Negro Invasion. Against the wow. Negro Invasion. And so the Sun, the Baltimore Sun, is the primary, you know, they weaponize this term, Negro Invasion. And so, uh, you know, to help facilitate making white neighborhoods completely white again. And so, you know, the name of my book is actually going to be uh, called The Black Butterfly, Why We Must Make Black Neighborhoods Matter. But I wanted mm. to tell that story uh, so that when you get to 2015, you can understand, oh, these white communities spent all this time hoarding resources. They were being greenlined. Right. You know, they were being advantaged structurally while black neighborhoods in the city were being structurally disadvantaged right. and redlined. And so that's really the story that the backdrop that leads you to 2015. Uh, and of course, actually, we had an uprising here uh, 50 years ago during the Holy Week uprisings after the assassination of Dr. King. So, you know, it's interesting that almost 50 years later, you would have had this uprising again after the murder of Freddie Gray um, uh, at Gilmore Homes or it, people began moving uh, and protesting in that community, the Western District Station, police station, uh, because Freddie Gray had been incarcerated or put into the hospital because he was hospitalized, he was in a coma. And when he died uh, on April 19th, 2015, people would go to Western District every day, like, and they ended up, police ended up setting up barricades and people would go out. Now I would go out, uh, I think around the 21st or 22nd, I began to go out and join the community uh, that was really angry about what had happened to their brother and, and their son and their friend. And here he is, they called him Pepper, some of them. Uh, and here he is, now he's dead. And, you know, you just this palpable sense of anger, frustration. I'd be at the barricade uh, in front of Western District and people would be like just unloading like all kinds of epithets and and in, invectives against the police who, who basically were standing there and just had to take it because people had their phones out, cameras out, and you could just sense palpable sense of trauma, you know, that folks have been hyper policed in this hyper segregated city. And so they were letting it letting their voice be heard. And you know, I think by I think that Wednesday, the by the 22nd or 23rd of April, the FOP Fraternal Order Police. Uh, president Gene Ryan, he came out of the media and said that the protester looked like a lynch mob. Wow! And it was like, whoa, whoa, hold up! Like, if anybody looks like a I lyncher, that. that's right. Who's the lyncher? It's the police. <laughs> you know, that's right. our police force is over fifty percent white. Like, if anybody looks like a lyncher, like it ain't us. Who at that point were very much peaceful. It was you who actually killed Freddie Gray. And so, you know, I think by that Saturday, this is the week leading up to uh, the 27th, there were clashes like at Camden Yards. We had, because we would march through the streets and shut down like downtown and uh, we put out an announcement and say, you know, hey, we're going um, we to march through uh, the city uh, at 3 p.m. And so the businesses would close at like 11 a.m. <laughs> and vacate. Uh, the city began to like basically, uh, and this was in now you skittish way. And this was when this, this was like April 25th, so okay. a couple days or during that week before. That's right, okay. You know, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, we're having these like shut down marches. I think a couple of groups tried to shut down the highway, so it was like this like massive, uh, emotional but very powerfully organized like series of protests leading up to the uprising itself which we have to say was on the day Freddie Gray was laid to rest right and so here we are uh, after these clashes at Camden Yard 
after the highway shutdowns, after the protests leading up to the uprising. And look at your timing. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are coming to North Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we bank right, that's when we'll, we'll head over to Penn, Penn and North. But, you know, it's on April 27th, which is a Monday, uh, Freddie Gray's been laid to rest. And the police let out this uh, memo that there's that the gangs are uniting to take them out. See, this is, <laughs> this, but, okay, so this is what I wanted, this is definitely what I wanted to ask, part of what I had to ask you about. Right. Because one of the things that I'm most interested in about this is that call. It was the, the claim that the BGF and others were, were going to attack the police. Right, that they somehow had a, a gang confab and they were uniting and publicly announcing that they were going to take out the exactly, police. <laughs> and, and, and we can't forget that not long before that was that random, crazy, I don't know if it was ever properly followed up event mm -hmm. of, a, of a lone black man running into one of the local police uh, uh, stations with a, with a, a I think an empty gun and a bag of weed saying he was the beginning of the BGF revolution against the police. Hmm. Um, and that had, I remember, had heightened the police concern mm -hmm. even as ridiculous as that event sounded mm -hmm. because he was clearly not together. Mm -hmm. And if this was the beginning of a revolutionary or uh, a military action, mm -hmm. this was one of the worst, most you know, embarrassing. <laughs> you know, you're gonna show up with an empty gun mm -hmm. and a and a bag of weed. I, and I have I need to be checked on that the details, but that, mm -hmm. that's how I remember that story. But I do know there was something like that mm -hmm. that just before mm -hmm. this this moment mm -hmm. had sort of. But there was not just the claim of the, the gangs mm -hmm. against the police, but there was a claim that there was going to be a purge. Right. Now, we have to say the FBI yeah. itself discredited the police meme or the... the, the Right, the, the mention that they put out. But does it? And that's about my this point. Gang takeover. Oh, but also, of the, to, I'm sorry. Right. You right. know, to, uh, take out police. You know, it was discredited. Like it was, it wasn't shown to be rooted in any reality. So, but that and the claim of the purge, with the, which the police used, and by the way, reiterated again in that documentary mm -hmm. on HBO, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which I wanted to ask you about also. Um, uh, was the reason why they were out in such high, uh, you know, um, this is what I'm looking for, task force right. force well, by noon riot gear, on the on riot gear. Mobilized in the, the preemptively thinking that uh, there was going to be this purge by students coming out of uh, But where is it? That, that has never been proved. That has never been corroborated. So right. That's what I'm saying. That, that too has never been corroborated. The BGF report right. was... was Dismissed by the feds, right? And then this report has never been right identified Nobody's in its origin. Found the meme. Nobody's been able to come up with. But was reported and defended right. mm -hmm. on Twitter by a Baltimore Sun, Sun reporter. Absolutely. And I remember going into the reporter's DMs, the direct mentions, and saying, you know, hey, this is you. You're heightening the atmosphere, and this is why Freddie Gray's been late the rest in the morning. Like brother can't even put the brother in the ground, and they're basically heightening the atmosphere charging the atmosphere for trouble and yeah this son the son reported putting out this information it was just like did you corroborate this did you check this like and so the, the the rumor begins to spread like wildfire the police already are mobilized for a riot and they come out in helmets uh with shields and gear and so you know, Freddie Gray's being put in the ground later that afternoon. The children of Douglas come out of the high school. They go to Mondiamond, which is across the street from where they go to school. They get on the public buses because they don't have a school bus system here in Baltimore right. to go home. And the police are somebody. They still haven't taken a responsibility for it. They shut the bus system down. The children have no way to get home. On the day of a highly charged funeral, highly charged in terms of emotion and people feeling all kinds of ways. Let me ask you this, because mm -hmm. I also had it reported to me at the time that students that day in school had been told and held in assembly formation before, mm -hmm. before being let out mm -hmm. that white supremacists were targeting them. Had you I hadn't heard, heard that? that? I hadn't heard that. So, um, yeah, that's something I'm still trying to follow up on, but right. I have... I But I, but it, I have... Uh, um, one for sure. I want to mm -hmm. say two at least separate se separate sources corroborating mm -hmm. that. But 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 just to add to the the potential, uh, uh, I don't know, firestorm that was bubbling. Right. Uh, 
and for those who aren't familiar, also there's a context of that Mondarm and Mall hub with those students and the police that goes back a long time of a lot of hostility, a lot of conflict, a lot of uh, messing with the students, a lot of uh, pulling them off buses and, and all kinds of stuff. So, so anyway, go ahead. I, yeah, I mean, so when they, when they, when children come out, now they can't go home. They're frustrated, angry, and grieving. Right. And I think that's an important point to realize, right. like, the ways in which black grief uh, gets short-circuited. Black people aren't allowed to grieve. People are just supposed to be all right with what's going on on the day of a funeral, no less. Right. And so, you know, the children, they throw objects at the police. The police, they throw objects back at the children. Next thing you know, the police are pulling out tear gas and deploying that, and it becomes... Um, at that point, everything breaks down and it spills over into coming north, Mondam is north of us. So it comes down. Uh, the police are marching against the children. You know, they're throwing stuff, police throwing stuff, <coughs> and it spills over here. And that's when it all goes down. And so, you know, people start looting. Uh, I characterize it. Uh, you know, they start burning cars. I characterize it as an uprising. I characterize it as, you know, looting took place, rioting took place, but nobody got killed. Uh, it wasn't, as a matter of fact, a week or so later in Waco, Texas, uh, there was a biker gang. They killed nine people. And that, right. that wasn't characterized right. as a riot. So, <laughs> I mean, so it's like the language that we use, like that was just like, oh, this is very odd. No one is killed here. Uh, by anybody on April 27th, but you know when the biker gang gets together, white biker gang, they all come and shoot up each other. Like that's not a riot. So it's like the language we use to deploy against like black versus white uh, folks that are engaged in some level of of di disorder. You know, if you can see how white supremacy, you know, plays a role in that. Because that's because one of the reasons why I'm asking you about this, because I am working on a piece for March 1st, which mm -hmm. is the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report being mm -hmm. published. And in that report of the many things that parallel to, to what we're talking about today is that they said that the media, while they thought did a good job in covering this, the, the so-called riots of mm -hmm. 1967, mm -hmm. and I got to always shout out everyone's place as we drive by it here on North Avenue, uh, the mm -hmm. best bookstore uh, I've ever been to. Um, um, the Kerner Commission said while they thought the press did a good job of covering it, that they thought that they had exaggerated the levels of violence and damage. Right. And that was definitely something that, that even Obama had to comment on mm -hmm. about what was happening here as we come right on at Penn and North. Right. As he was saying that the, the CNN helicopter flying around here, putting the loop of the, the CVS and all that other stuff, had created this sense that the whole city... Mm -hmm. I mix what I like, what I...